Hey, what's up YouTube? 104th Maverick checking in with another video. This time we're looking at something completely different from the normal combat operations we do on the channel and we're jumping into the fantastic Kali Mata Concord for X-Plane 11. This aircraft has been available for a while in early access and is still going through its development cycle. Currently the aircraft is in its open beta phase of development and the team estimates a rough roadmap of around about two years for final release. What I'm going to do in this video is show you guys from start to finish how to fly the Concorde from London to New York as close to how they did it in real life as possible with the current state of development in this X-Plane aircraft. Now before we dive in, I have a little disclaimer that I want to get out there first. As I've mentioned, this aircraft is still in the open beta stage of development. This means there are several compromises that we have to make when flying the aircraft. Compromises which hardcore Concorde sim enthusiasts might not be able to swallow right now. And you guys might want to hold off and wait until the aircraft is further along in its development roadmap. Some of the incorrect or missing features at this stage, which I'll go into in more detail during the video, include no ability to adjust the chrono timer or v-speed bugs, limited AFCS functionality that does not include max climb, max cruise, indicated airspeed hold or auto land, limited SIVA functionality, no manual option to move the fuel around the aircraft, incorrect altitude callout readings from the engineer when landing, and overpowered engines. Now I know that for some of you, this is going to be a total deal breaker. I kind of thought the same thing as well on my first flight in the aircraft, but trust me, as someone who already has more than 2,000 hours flying Concorde on Vatsim many, many years ago, as a younger and happier man in my 20s, you can get the Concorde experience with this aircraft. The magic is still there. We just have to make a few compromises along the way. And I think that if you stick with the video to the end, I hope you'll agree with me that the Concorde that we have right now is very flyable and there's a lot of Concorde enjoyment to be had right now in its current development stage. Right, let's get started. God damn it, I forgot to add one more thing. The aircraft's own SIVA system doesn't work very well. It's in early access right now, as I mentioned, so it will give you some issues from time to time. It is highly recommended not just by myself, but also by the aircraft's developer to use the Philips add-on SIVA plugin for X-Plane, and I'll link that in the video description. It is payware, but it only costs 12 bucks, and it's well worth the price. In time, the aircraft's own SIVA system will end up getting its full functionality. However, for now, please just use the Philips SIVA system for X-Plane in conjunction with the aircraft for best results while it's in its open beta stage. So here we are at London Heathrow Gate 421, which is one of the gates Concorde used in real life, as she never saw Terminal 5 in her time, as it didn't exist back then. I thought most of the hardcore Concorde fans would want to load up at this gate for their first flight to New York City, so I thought I would start here with this tutorial so that you guys can see the full process and enter the same navigation data into the aircraft that you see in this video. Right, let's quickly talk about setup. Click on the GUI in the bottom left hand of the screen to enter into the main menu for the Collimata Concorde, then select Settings. Here you can change the volume and utility settings for the aircraft. You also have the option to turn on Pro Mode. Now, total disclosure, obviously because I'm a trained professional, I fly with Pro Mode engaged all the time. However, I didn't know about this mode early on, and for the first three or four days I flew the aircraft, I actually flew with Pro Mode off, which is what I recommend that you do. I recommend you fly with Pro Mode off for the first week or so as you get used to the aircraft. Having Pro Mode on, doesn't seem to be fully coded just yet in the open beta version of the aircraft, however it does change how the aircraft reacts in certain situations. 
The most notable change being how quickly the aircraft accelerates after passing Mach 1.3. With Pro Mode off, the aircraft goes like a rocket ship. And it's not that realistic, but I don't want that to put you off from keeping uh, Pro Mode disengaged because it is a very useful tool to help learn the aircraft. Having Pro Mode disengaged will also stop the aircraft from accelerating above Mach 2.02 .02, and that'll help you get used to the climb and also the supersonic cruise. Like I said, I do recommend starting with Pro Mode off just until you've been flying the aircraft for about a week and then turn it on once you've got some experience flying around and have fun noticing some of the different characteristics that the aircraft will have. As you can also see, there is an option to use the Philips SIVA INS system in the main menu and we want to make sure that we have that selected. Okay, so now that we have our settings done, let's get our aircraft load sheet ready. Go back to the main Concorde menu and select Flight Preparation and then Payload Manager. Select how many passengers you want to take along and how much cargo. For this flight, we're going to go with the British Airways standard 100 passenger configuration with a full load of freight. Next, select Fuel Manager. When I fly the aircraft from London to New York or New York to London, I usually always go with 8 to 5 tonnes of fuel but I have a lot of experience in flying the aircraft on this route and I can be quite efficient at it. When you're first starting out in the aircraft, I recommend that you take 90, 90 tonnes of fuel instead, just for a little bit of a safety overhead, so that if you get slightly lost on the way there, or you have to use afterburner for longer than is intended during the climb, you're not in any danger of running out of fuel when you get to the other end. The aim at the other end is to land with less than 19 tonnes of fuel to be under our maximum landing weight, but we also want to have more than 10 tonnes of fuel on board in case we need to divert to go and land somewhere else and for a few other reasons that I don't want to get into right now. But just remember that as a general rule, we want to land with more than 10 tonnes of fuel but less than 19 tonnes of fuel. Okay, let's click apply. So now our load sheet is done for New York, let's start getting the aircraft ready. First thing we want to do is get some ground power on the aircraft. Simply go to the Concorde main menu, select aircraft, then doors and ground and turn on the GPU and you can also turn on the air conditioning cart here as well. It's also a good idea to open the doors so that we can let the passengers in the aircraft and you can deploy the stairs on the side of the aircraft if we're not connected up to an air bridge. You can also activate some other cool looking services around the aircraft from this screen. However, because I'm using the Vulcan API engine on X-Plane right now, sadly it doesn't show the ground vehicles in this stage of its development. So I can't show you the fuel trucks and the catering trucks that are. They actually look very, very good in the OpenGL version of X-Plane. All right, now that the load sheet's done, that's the last thing we need to do in relation to getting the aircraft set up and we can actually concentrate on the cockpit now and working our way through the aircraft's checklists. The checklists that come with the aircraft are fantastic. They really will look after you if you follow them as you progress along your flight. There are some items missing from the checklist that we have in the X-Plane Concorde that are included in the real aircraft and on some other simulated Concords as well. And I'll make sure to point those items out as we go along the flight so we can keep the checklist moving. Because the aircraft is still in open beta, these items have not been included in our checklist just yet. But I'm sure once the aircraft is finished and it moves along its development roadmap, these additional items will be incorporated into the checklists so we can have the same high fidelity checklist as the other aircraft. You'll notice that in the bottom left hand corner next to our GUI that there are several little boxes that we can click on. These are our view panels for moving around the cockpit. We can use Track IR with X-Plane, but it is very clunky. You're basically locked into the captain's seat and you can't move around easily. So I found that it's much easier for me to fly an X-Plane with Track IR off and use these panels to move around the aircraft. By clicking on the different buttons, you will be placed in different panels in the cockpit. You can save these viewpoints in X-Plane by using the left control button on your keyboard and pressing any number on the numpad. Alright, let's get our checklist up by clicking on the last button on the right here in the bottom left of the screen. We can skip the external checks. We can also skip the safety page as well, as all these selections are automatically made when you load up into the aircraft when it's cold and dark. 
Now obviously you can go down this checklist if you want to, but for the sake of saving time for the video, I'm just going to skip it. Okay, preliminary cockpit checks. Technical log we don't have. Ground power. The indication that the GPU is connected is not modelled on the aircraft just yet, so we'll skip this step and go straight to turning on the batteries. Main batteries. We'll turn both these on now and we'll hear that the aircraft starts to come to life. The equipment bay cooling switches. The next thing we'll do is get our equipment bay cooling switch panel up and running and turn on all six switches. The oxygen panel. We'll reach down and get our oxygen online so that we don't have any issues down route. We'll now come to the captain's seat and then up to the overhead panel for the drain master heaters and we'll make sure that those are on. The next thing we do is come down for the INS and we'll come down to the engineer panel and check the INS to stand by on one, two and three. Now at this stage you can fully enter in your position and start the INS alignment process, however I'm going to skip quickly to the next items on the checklist and we'll come back and talk about how we set up the payware INS system to work with the aircraft. The next item is our air data computers. We'll come down and turn those on. And then the no smoking and seatbelt signs. We don't want to go past this stage without turning on our Philips SIVA INS system. So we'll select that from the plug-in menu and turn the system to standby to bring it to life. Once the system is on, the first thing we do is move the rotary dial around to DSRTK slash STS. We do this to ensure the system is not in nav mode and is displaying a zero on the left of the right screen to verify that it is not in nav mode. When it is in nav mode, that zero will change to a one. Nine represents our current alignment code, which is bad, and five represents the target alignment which the system is trying to achieve. Zero is the indication for the best alignment possible from the system. We'll now move the rotary switch back to POS for position and verify that waypoint zero is selected and we can now input our present position at gate 421 at Heathrow to tell the system where it is in the world. By clicking on the left screen on the INS, we can enter into keyboard entry mode. This is indicated by a K on the top left of the INS to show that we are in keyboard mode. Now we can use the numpad on our keyboard to add in data to the INS computer. From the airport chart, it tells us that our position here at gate 421 is north 5127.6, west 0026.7. So to enter that into the aircraft, we first press 2 for north and then type 51276 and press enter on the numpad for insert. Now we press 4 for west and enter simply 267 and press enter and that gives us north 51276 west 267. The aircraft now knows where it is located in the world and we can now initiate the INS alignment process. The first thing we do to start the alignment is to move the rotary selector switch back to DSRTK slash STS to show our INS status. Then by moving the top rotary switch from standby to align, we can begin the INS alignment procedure. It's very important at this stage to do the same thing on the aircraft INS selection switches behind us on the engineering panel. Even though we do not enter any navigation information on the aircraft's INS system, because we've entered it on our payware INS system, the aircraft will fly the programmed route, but we still want to make sure that these switches are set to align on all three INS systems. Because we are using Pro Mode, we see a flashing white light on each of our INS indicators. This is to tell us that the system is still working on the alignment process and is not ready to enter into nav mode just yet. When you're not using Pro Mode, as soon as you set the switch to align, it fast tracks the alignment and you'll instantly see a green ready nav light 
on each INS selector switch, indicating that the system is ready to go into nav mode. But because we are using pro mode for this flight, we'll have to wait for that alignment process to take place in real time, which normally takes just a little bit less than 10 minutes. Moving on to the before engine start checklist, we come to our overhead panel and set our master CBs into position. The cockpit preparation is complete, oxygen is on and checked, windows are checked, closed and locked. Flight control inverters are on. Flight control augmentators are on and selected to blue, blue and blue. The anti-stall system is on. The RAD INS switch is set to RAD. The instrument transfer switches are set to the captain's side. The altimeter is set for the current conditions, 1015 and we'll cross check that on the co-pilot side, 1015. Audio panel COM1 is set on. Nav radios, we'll take London on 1, 1136 and Compton on 2, 11435. Brakes are checked on. Cathy 276, I do apologise, we're going to delay the push, uh, GSX isn't very nice today. Huh, I know that feeling, Spirit 276, Roger, just uh, we'll take call those on now. Throttle master call switches, ready, yeah, we'll change those ticket. from main to alternate. Ground hydraulic checkout, we'll jump back to the engineer station and check that we have yellow yellow selected, and both switches are in the off position. We also check that our fuel heaters are set to auto. The secondary air doors are set to auto. And the engine recirculation valves are shut. And the final item for this half of the checklist, check that the batteries are on. Moving on with the second half of the checklist, we can finalise our INS navigation. We can see that we still have flashing white lights to indicate that our INS is still in alignment. And if we check our pop-up payware INS, we can see that our alignment drift code is still 9. So we have a little while to wait before we can enter into nav mode. We can however start entering in navigation data for our waypoints at this stage. To do this we move the rotary selection switch back to waypoint and select 1 for waypoint 1. We'll now enter in the latitude and longitude of Compton, which is the first waypoint on our route out to New York, and the rest of our waypoints along the route. I'll make sure to put all this navigation data in the video description for you guys. So Compton is north 51295, west 1132. Next up after that is Malby, north 51356, west 2037. Then Kessup, north 51195, west 3393. Then onward to Merley, north 51200, west 5000. Then outbound to Leslu, north 51000, west 8000. Bravo, good day. We're at uh, around 594 in an AC50, requesting clearance to Sydney itself. Okay, so that's the first nine waypoints of our flight plan inserted into the aircraft. And this will take uh, us just so over halfway across the North Atlantic. And once we get airborne and on our way towards New York, 
will enter in more navigation data as we fly over the waypoints. We're at a stage now where we have to wait for our INS alignment to finish before we can continue with the rest of the checklist. So while we're waiting on that to happen, we'll go ahead and grab our clearance from the Heathrow ground controller since we're on VATSIM for our flight out to New York. Shuttle 14 for Park Heathrow ground, good evening. Continue taxi Alpha stand 509er. Ground to low, Spielberg Concord 1, radio check. Uh, Spielberg Concord 1, receiving your readability 5. Hello to you sir, Spielberg Concord 1, stand 421, information Romeo's on board 1015, clearance to Kennedy. Spielberg Concord 1, clear to JFK, will be Compton 3, Golf departure off T7 left, score kids 4467. Be clear to Kennedy on the Compton Free Golf from 27 left, 4467 the squawk for Speedbird 1. Speedbird 1, read back correct. Okay, now that we have our clearance, we'll go ahead and set our squawk code before we forget that, and we'll also turn our transponder to. Kathy T76 for an easy departure if you make the turn on to Lima, uh, that'll be uh, right on Lima, and then you can continue Alpha Hold, um, Alpha Yankee 3. Uh, we'll take a left on Lima and join Alpha Alpha Yankee 3, Cathay 276, thank you. Or if it's easy, if you, if you want to taxi straight up north onto Lima and then make the right turn on... To we Alpha. can see that our INS alignment has reached the point where we now have a green ready nav light on all three INS systems and we can enter into nav mode and continue on with the rest of our checks. We can also see from our pop-up INS that our drift code is now zero, which means no drift. So we'll go ahead now and select nav from the top rotary selector and observe the green nav light going out. We can also see that from our status page on our INS, it is now displaying a one to show that the INS system is now in navigation mode. Now that we have selected nav on our pop-up payware INS, we need to make sure that we also select it on the aircraft INS panel before we go any further on the checklist at this stage. So we'll select NAV on INS 1, 2 and 3. Next we set our ASI bugs and pitch index. Now we can't set up the ASI bugs just yet in the open beta version, however we can set our pitch index. And we'll set this to 13 and a half degrees, which is the pitch angle we'll rotate to on takeoff. Fuel flow bugs were unable to set at this stage. Clock, we'll go ahead and move the selector to chrono. Throttle lever indices were unable to set. And the takeoff briefing. Okay, so it's going to be a Compton free golf departure from 27 left. So we have uh, London set on nav 1, 1136. We take off on the runway heading. And then we intercept the 256 radial from London 1136, which will get set. 256 is set. And then once we get to London DME 7, we turn right heading 269 degrees. And then we're inbound to Woodley. And we'll set Woodley 352. Uh, overhead Woodley, we should be intercepting the 101 radial from Compton on 11435 on a heading of 281 degrees. So we'll set 281, we've got Compton 11435 and we'll set the 101 radial. Our altitude, we're climbing 6,000 feet and we'll dial that up top. And we'll fly the restriction at 250 knots. Okay, so the briefing is done, the load sheet is checked. We can hop in the back now and check our fuel in our center of gravity position. We'll adjust the lights here to make it easier to see. The load limits and takeoff data are all checked and set. So what we'll do now is we'll get our start clearance and we'll get the doors on the aircraft closed, get the master warning tested, the anti-collision lights on, and then we'll get the engine feed pumps and the engine started up. Now we just need our start clearance and we'll turn our fuel pumps on. Fox 
Oh, we are cleared to Philly on an Umlaut 1 Fox Truck departure, squawking 7665. Speedbird 49 and Zulu, correct. Ground, Speedbird Concord 1, we're ready for our push and start from stand 421. Speedbird 1, push and start approved. Speedbird 1, push and start. Alright, now we have the start clearance, we'll call our tug in for the pushback and we'll get our doors closed. Ground to cockpit, tow is driving up. Now we'll check the master warning. Hey, sir, Grand, good evening. This is KLM one zero three two with the stand four one nine. With information, Romeo uh, got the And turn on the anti-collision lights. Check the throttles are idle. KLM one zero three two, stand by. Okay. And we'll jump in the back and put the fuel pumps on for each Ready engine. Now that we're ready to start our engines, we'll come up top and open our cross bleed valves and our air bleed control valves for each engine. Second rail onto Alpha and we'll hold to the Pluto for speed bird for Papango. KLM 1032, you're cleared to Schiphol at Brookman's Park, 7 Fox departure, correction. Park, now that the air is all configured, we can go ahead and hit the starter switch for engine number 3 first. We'll come to the front of the aircraft and look for 12% on our N2 gauge for engine number 3. And when we see it go through 12%, we'll introduce the fuel with the high pressure fuel switch for engine number 3. We'll then observe the engine as it spills through 30%, which is the level we would hold the engine at if we were required to do a debo procedure, and we'll make sure that it goes all the way through 30% up to 67 ground idle. The engine does not go through a rotating stall in this stage in the X-plane development, so it won't go all the way up to 70%, but instead will just stop at 67 67%. Great, so speedbird 43% guys five minutes destination, Cape Town. Speedbird 43, thank you, just confirm your star number again. 327. Once the engine is online, you, sir, we will then turn Cape on the air conditioning unit for that engine and turn on the hydraulic system linked to engine number 3. We'll also turn on the electrical generator for engine number 3 so we can start generating our own power. And finally, we'll turn off the air bleed control valve and the cross bleed valve for engine number 3. We'll now repeat the same procedure for engine number 2. Speedbird 80 Bravo, push and start approved, face north. Push and start approved, face north. I'll quickly turn the volume up here so you can hear it better.
This time we turn on the hydraulic system partially ran from engine number two and we'll wait until we have all four engines up and running before turning on the final system, the yellow system. We now have enough hydraulic power to lower the nose and we can start the pushback by releasing the brakes. Ah, I forgot to unplug the GPU. Ah, don't worry folks, those ground guys are pretty fast and plus those hoses are nice and long for a reason. I'm sure everything will be fine down there, don't worry. Okay, engine number one coming online. Thank you, brake speed, but four five tango contact Heathrow Tower one one eight decimal five Dubai. One one eight decimal five for speed bird four five tango, I'm not leaving sir. Thank you. And finally, engine Speed number four. Speed Bird 82 Bravo, second right alpha, hold short, please sir. Second right alpha, hold short, please go. Speed Bird 82 Bravo. Operation complete, set parking brake. Disconnecting tow, stand by. We'll now take on the yellow hydraulic system and check that all three systems are on. So is disconnected and bypass pin has been removed. Hand signal on the left. We'll see you next time and have a safe flight. Now I did skip the before pushback checklist specifically because in the X-Plane aircraft it tells you it almost insinuates that you start all four engines on stand. However, you don't do that. You just start the first two engines on stand and then you start engines number one and four while you're pushing the aircraft back. So I'm happy to do these checklist items now while we're in the pushback position. So we'll select our emergency hydraulic generator to ground bypass now and close the electrical SSB switch. We have enough power now from all four engines running to power the galley switches for the cabin crew so we'll turn on the generators for generator 1 and 3 and 2 and 4. We'll also turn on the water heater while we're here. Taxi lights are not required. We've checked with the ground crew to make sure all the services are clear. Our flight controls are checked and the visor is down with the parking brake still on. OK, the before taxi checklist. Engines 1, 2, 3 and 4 are all running. Nose wheel steering is checked. Flight controls AFCS trims are all set. Flight controls AFCS and trims are all set. Master warning is checked, there's nothing there. Engine anti-ice is off. Engine control schedule will set to flyover. Brake fans are on. 
engine idle switch is set to low. Stall warnings are tested and off. Good evening. Engine feed Squared pumps are all on. Madrid, the hydraulics are checked. Uh, Go yep. Electrics are checked and ground bypass two, is set. The ground secure. services are clear. Nose to five. Brakes are set and normal. Flight instruments are checked and set. And we are trimmed for takeoff. The before taxi checklist is complete. Iber 3 1 Charlie Romeo, Roger, push and start is approved. Okay, we're ready to taxi now. We'll call ground and get our clearance to runway 27 left. Ground, Speedboat Concord 1, we're ready for 27 left, 1015. Speedboat Concord 1, thank you, taxi right Sierra, hold Sierra 1. Right Sierra, hold Sierra 1, Speedboat 1. Now that we have the clearance, we'll apply a little bit of power just in case we're on a hill and the aircraft wants to roll backwards and release the parking brake. We'll then check our brakes work and that the nose wheel steering is working correctly. Okay, she's feeling good. We'll take the taxi turn lights on now. Now we'll ask the engineer to start trimming the fuel to take off. Fuel trim to take off. We'll go to our overhead panel and check our engine rating mode is set to take off and turn on our auto ignition switches and also turn on the auto throttles. We'll double check that our drain master heaters are on and the engine flight rating is set to climb. We'll then turn on our pressure static heaters and ADS engine probe heaters. We'll then hop in the back and make sure that our engine number 4 N1 takeoff limiter is set to 88%. Recheck the air conditioning panel. Fuel panel is checked. Anti skid system has no lights. Reverse or shut off check, throttles mid and back. Seats and harnesses are checked. Tank 11 fuel amount we cannot set. D air pumps set to on in tanks 11, 10, 5A and 7A. And we can also set the inlet and outlet valves to auto. Okay, before takeoff checklist, briefing takeoff data is checked, landing lights not required, transponder is set on, we'll take mode Charlie once we get our takeoff clearance, brake temperature warning lights are checked, AFCS autopilot values are set, takeoff monitor will get on the runway, reheat switches on the runway, pitch index is set, radar not required, and the takeoff clearance we'll get from tower. Speedbird 1, Sierra 1. 
Uh, concept Tower 118 Decimal 5, good, bye. 1185, thanks, be good one. Key for Terror, hello, Speedbird, Concord 1, see you one. So the Concord 1, hello. Uh, runway 27F, clear takeoff, 320 degrees, 3 knots. Speedbird, Concord 1, copy, clear takeoff, 27 left. Right, we're cleared for takeoff. We'll go ahead and squawk mode Charlie now so we don't forget. And we'll position on the center line. The only items we have left to do are arm the afterburners and turn on the takeoff monitor. So our speedbird one, can you confirm our departure frequency please sir? Yeah, speedbird one, you'll be going to 129425. When advised, 129425, thanks, speedbird one. I always like to check before departure what the planned departure frequency is for me, because there's a lot to do in Concord after takeoff, and trying to tune a frequency you were not expecting makes life a little bit more tricky. Now a word of note here. Remember what I said at the start of the video guys, the engines are too overpowered right now in this open beta version of the aircraft, so we have to make some compromises on takeoff so that we don't exceed the restrictions. We're going to do our own noise abatement call at roughly 60 seconds burn time, rather than wait for the engineer to call out 3, 2, 1, noise. That call is automatic on the aircraft, but at the moment, in my opinion, it doesn't work very well because of the overpowered engines you end up way too high and fast for where you actually should end up. So we'll do our own 3-2-1 noise call. Another thing to remember is that the V-speed callouts are not accurate right now. So when the first officer calls rotate, I will start to slowly rotate the aircraft, but I won't worry about him calling V-2 too quickly after that, and I'll continue to rotate the aircraft slowly up towards 12 degrees, not exceeding 13 and a half degrees, and then once we're airborne, we'll pitch up slightly to 15 degrees nose up. Once we pass through 240 knots, we'll start pitching the aircraft up towards 20 degrees to maintain 250 knots. Okay guys, the moment has finally arrived and we're ready for takeoff. We'll arm the afterburners and turn on the takeoff monitor. Hold on to your hats ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Brakes released. Three, two, one, now. Three, two, one, now. Speedboat one, now. Airspeed building. Step one, Roger. One hundred knots. Check. Power set. Gear up, please. Gear coming up. Two hundred and fifty gear up. Doors locked. Two hundred and fifty. Three, two, one. Noise. Afterburners off. Takeoff monitor set to off. So we're climbing for 250 knots and we're looking for the 256 radio from London. Three bird one, contact London 129.45. London 129425, bye bye, speed bird one. Take the hand off. Two bird, three one tango, descend flight level eight zero. Eight zero, three bird, three one tango. And here comes the radio now for London. Two five six. We'll turn left with the radio now. Charlie, contact one, contact one. 
Stand by. And we'll fly the radial outbound until we get to seven miles, and then we'll make the right hand turn two seven zero inbound Woodley. Still hand flying aircraft. Just climbing nice and easy. David, three one tango, turn left heading three six zero degrees. Two forty knots is okay. Three six zero degrees, too bad. Three one tango. Two three one tango, report the heading to Gatwick on one two six left Malay two five. Put the Gatwick and port heading one two six. Okay, seven miles, so we'll start to turn right now. Two six nine two seven zero degrees. Landing good evening, Speedbird Concord one on the Compton Free Golf, passing three thousand two hundred. Speedbird one, London Squawk Ident. Ident, Speedbird one. Still trying to keep as much power off the aircraft here. You'll notice I've not went full dry power or anything. Contact one seven tango descend flight for We actually have a lot of power zero. off the aircraft at the moment. Rolling out two seven zero. Two two London. Hello there. And now we'll tune Compton on Nav one and set one zero one for the inbound radio. Two eight four Bedek one Charlie descend flight level one nine zero. You can get it, there it goes. So it should be overhead Woodley, intercepting a 101 radio for Compton. That's going to give us a heading of 281 degrees. Peabird 1, climb flight level 70. Peabird 1, climb flight level 70. So still climbing with 250 knots. This always looks beautiful on X plane when you come up above the clouds like this, always looks awesome. Right, I've got a clearance up to flight level 70 because we're going above the transition altitude. We'll remember and recycle our altimeter. Speedbird 1 4 Charlie, confirm direct Lelna. Let's get some autopilots in here to help me out. Set, set, um, and set. Negative, I don't know if I'm heading straight towards um, Land Bend. Okay, direct Lelna, please. Okay, we'll send that direct Lelna, people. And here's the radio for Compton. We'll turn right to intercept the radio. Golf Alpha Echo, your readability is We can bring the nose and the visor up now. And the after takeoff checklist. Okay, the landing gear is up. The afterburners are safe, and the takeoff monitor is off. We'll ask the engineer to start trimming the fuel for flight. Climb one three zero, speed one. Fuel trim to flight. Speed three request descent. And London's given us a climb flight level 130, so we'll get that set. We're still on our track heading 281. And now we'll take direct Compton with our INS. Select waypoint 01 so that we go direct to Compton from our present position and engage INS navigation mode on the AFCS panel. Speedbird 1 requesting high speed. Stand by, break. Ah, it was Bravo, worth a try. Always looking for some cheeky high speed in Concord. If we, any time we can get it, we want to ask for it. Second going beforehand, say again. Okay, it's uh, Speedbird Concord 1 requesting high speed. That's approved. Speedbird 1, no speed, thanks. Now that we have the high speed clearance, we'll go ahead and apply full dry power as we're above 7,000 feet. And we'll allow the aircraft to accelerate forward. And as we hit 350 knots, we'll start pitching up a little bit more. Contact 1 1 Charlie Gatwick, direct to 126, Now that we're up and climbing away, we'll reset our rad alt morning height to 200 feet, our decision height into New York. We'll also change the rad INS switch to INS, now that we're in INS navigation. And again, we're going to have the auto throttle alarmed, ready to capture the indicated airspeed as we get faster. Noise abatement checklist is complete, the takeoff monitor is off, the reheats are stored. Passing through 10,000 feet, we'll come up top to our overhead panel. And we'll change our engine rating mode from takeoff to flight. 
We'll then hop in the back to the engineer station. We have no intentions of going back to land, so we'll turn our brake fans off and our engine control schedule will change that from flyover to normal and we'll check that the fuel is moving aft. Speedbird 1 requesting further plane. Speedbird 1, negative, I'm afraid you can have to maintain 130 for now. Speedbird 1, 130. Three, there must be some traffic out ahead of us stopping our claim here. Subject 17 Tango descend for level 100 expedite. Now that we're heading away from Compton, we'll go ahead and start our INS DME update process to keep our system as accurate as possible. The first thing we'll do is click on the left screen to go into keyboard mode and then we'll press left alt on the keyboard and press number 7 and number 9 on the numpad at the same time and that'll take us into DME entry mode. Once we're in DME entry mode we'll be able to enter in a new set of coordinates for the waypoints that we have available and on waypoint 1 we want to enter Compton which is north 51295 west 1132. Now that we've entered in the coordinates of the VOR we have to tell the system which altitude the VOR is located at. We do that by pressing left alt on the keyboard again and pressing the number 3 and the number 9 on the numpad together at the same time. This will take us into altitude entry mode and we press the number 2 to tell the system that we're going to enter in thousands of feet. The altitude for Compton is 854 feet and we always round up. So we're going to press 1 for 1000 feet and then press insert. We can now press waypoint change and the number 1 while we're in the DME entry mode. And because we have Compton selected on navigation radio 1, the system will start doing its DME update from Compton. We would want nothing further there, Unicom 122.8, find your discretion, bye. 122 decimal eight. thanks, bye bye, speed 1. Here we are approaching 28,000 feet which is our subsonic cruise altitude out to our acceleration point. You can see we have an indicated airspeed hold on of about 385 knots which is ideal going through 26,000 feet. That will give us a Mach number of around 0.93 and as we get higher to 28,000 feet that will then transfer to Mach 0.95. We haven't really changed anything on the aircraft apart from turning the seatbelt signs off as we got near 20,000 feet. And the centre of gravity has changed on the aircraft as well now that we're a little bit faster. The engineer has trimmed more fuel to the rear of the aircraft. As we see Mach 0.95 come up on the Mach meter, we'll change from indicated airspeed hold to Mach hold. Now it's just a case of waiting until we reach our acceleration point and starting our supersonic climb. Ok, we're approaching our acceleration point now, waypoint 3, Kessup, we're 18 miles away. We're going to get our autopilot set up and ready for the climb. So the first thing we'll do is set 60,000 feet on the prime, and we'll also go ahead and get our vertical speed primed up. In the real aircraft they wouldn't do this, they wouldn't use vertical speed to do the supersonic climb. They would use their max climb autopilot mode. Unfortunately we don't have access to that mode right now in the open beta version of the X-Plane Concorde. Like I said at the start of the video, this is one of the compromises, one of the main compromises that we have to make, is that we have to do this supersonic climb in vertical speed rather than max climb. Approaching just three miles to the acceleration point now. So the procedure is going to be we're going to disengage the auto throttle and then overhead to the acceleration point we're going to engage altitude acquired on the autopilot. The autopilot is going to automatically start pitching up to capture the vertical speed requirement. As the autopilot's pitching the nose up, we're going to gently apply full dry power. So here comes the turn, vertical speed is captured, we'll gently apply full dry power as the nose goes up, and we're looking for the airspeed to actually start dropping a little bit, so we'll manipulate the vertical speed to make sure that the airspeed starts coming down just a little, then we'll fire the inboard afterburners and the outboard afterburners. 
pitching up to try and avoid a uh, mag overspeed, which is more or less inevitable. Straight through the speed of sound. No bumps, no bangs. Hitting the Mac overspeed warning, just because the engines are so powerful. There's a lot of thrust going through them right now. We're already through 30,000 feet. We're at maximum climb on the autopilot, so our Mac overspeed should come off very soon. We're already going through Mac 1.10. So our passengers will definitely be feeling the acceleration back there. Now that we are below the Mach overspeed warning, we'll start bringing the rate of climb down to keep our Mach meter as close to the limit as possible. So you see, as the Mach limit gets higher, we bring the nose down, we bring the vertical speed down to get our white Mach needle as close to the yellow and black Mac limit needle as possible. The next checklist item for us is going to be Mac 1.3 to make sure that the ramps, our inlet ramps, are moving to control the shockwave position inside the engines. And that'll be coming up very shortly. So again, we're just manipulating the rate of climb here to keep our Mac needle as close to the limit as possible. We're not so concerned with the indicated airspeed needle right now. It's more the Mac needle that we're watching. So as our speed gets close to the limit, we'll start pitching up. And it's basically a case of managing this process to stay as close to the limit as you possibly can until we get to Mac 1.7 where we'll turn the afterburner off. Okay, Mac 1.3, the engineer confirms that the ramps are moving. We'll take a quick look over our shoulder and just see that that's happening. We can see the gauges here. We can see that the ramps are, are just slowly starting to come in. Our climb checklist is complete. We'll actually take a, our external heating off the aircraft very soon. The aircraft's getting warmer all the time. So we don't have any requirement for external heating at this stage, but we'll get to that in a minute. Again, we're just manually adjusting this vertical speed so that we can keep our Mac needle as close to the limit as possible. Still in INS navigation. The needle's getting a little close to the limit now, so we'll put on a bit more climb. Forty thousand feet already. Forty thousand feet. And she wants to keep climbing. So Mach 1.7 is going to come up pretty quickly. And we'll prepare to turn the afterburners off. Mach 1.67, 1.68, 1.69. We'll take the outboards off and the inboards off. Through Mach 1.7 the noise gets considerably quieter in the cockpit now. And we can start pitching the nose down. Again, we want to come back to keeping our Mach needle as close to the limit as possible while we continue to climb and accelerate to Mach 2 under dry power. 45,000 feet. Our accelerate to Mach 2 checklist is complete. Next up is our Mach 2 flight checklist.
As I mentioned earlier, we no longer need our external heating, so we can turn off our pressure static heaters and our ADS engine probe heaters. The aircraft is getting very, very warm on the outside, so we don't have any requirement for any external heaters right now. In fact, once we're up to Mach 2, the front of the aircraft will actually be more than 120 degrees Celsius, so you could cook some eggs out there. Mach 1.8, and she still wants to climb. And we can see that the ramps are continuing to employ. Unfortunately, we see this Tic Tac is back. I hate this thing. Sadly, this is a, a bug in X Plane. This has got nothing to do with aircraft. This is an X Plane bug. Unfortunately, that is our own contrail. Hopefully, they're going to fix that bug at some point soon. Tic Tac's confirmed. Okay, I can see from our DME2 readout that we're within range of Cork in Ireland, which is our second DME update point. So we're going to get our second DME update sorted very soon. We're approaching 50,000 feet at the moment. And this is the next checklist item for us at this stage. We want to try and nail 50,000 feet in Mach 2 around about the same time, which is what would happen in real life. They're not quite exactly synced up with each other, but in real life, Concorde would reach 50,000 feet roughly the same time as it would reach Mach 2. So the golden rule for us as we approach 50,000 feet is we don't want to climb to more than, for example, 51,000 feet. We don't want to go above 50,000 feet unless we're actually at Mach 2. 49,000 feet now. So we're just always making adjustments here as we get closer, just to keep our max speed as close to the limit as possible without triggering the overspeed warning. And here comes 50,000 feet. Mach 1.98. So it looks like we're going to be on profile. Fifty thousand feet. And there's 50,000 feet. Passing Mach 2. Mach 2 is right behind it. Okay, welcome to the 50,000 feet, twice the speed of sound club. We'll come up to our overhead panel now that we're above 50,000 feet in Mach 2. Change our engine flight rating from the climb rating that has been in up until this point to cruise and just verify that our pressure static heaters are off, the ADS engine probe heaters are off and the seatbelt signs are off. And now we'll continue to climb just nice and easy up to 60,000 feet. We can jump back into the engineer panel to check that the fuel is moving aft and we can also turn off the pumps in tanks 5A and 7A as they are now empty. We no longer require the D-air pump in tank 11 and we'll also turn that off. Now that we're above Mach 2, we're actually at Mach 2.02, we'll continue to adjust the vertical speed to maintain the Mach limit. Now the aircraft will climb between 1 and 2,000 feet per minute until it gets to around about 55 to 56,000 feet. And then at that point we'll have to dial the rate of climb down to something less than 500 feet per minute and the aircraft will just keep gently climbing up. Now that we're heading west we'll go ahead and we'll tune the VOR at Cork in Ireland and we'll start our second DME update for the flight. So Cork is on 1146 and we'll go ahead and bring up our pop-up payware INS and then we'll enter into DME update mode by going into keyboard entry mode, pressing left alt and then 7 and 9 on the numpad together. We'll now make sure that we're on waypoint 2 
and we'll enter in the latitude and longitude for the Cork VOR and that's going to be 51504 and west 8296. We'll also enter in the altitude at 1000 feet. And we can check from the distance menu how far the INS computer thinks the aircraft is from Cork versus how far the navigation beacon is telling us we are away. And we see that that distance matches up to within a mile. And then we can go back to waypoint and press waypoint change number two. We're now doing a DME update from Cork. And we'll just gently keep climbing up towards flight level 600. And if we ever find ourselves slower than Mach 2, then we'll actually just descend to accelerate back up to Mach 2 and then start gently climbing again. Okay, so the dreaded scenario has arrived. We are in the middle of the North Atlantic and an oceanic controller has came online. I don't want you guys to panic. I know that oceanic control can seem very intimidating, but it's actually very straightforward and I'll just quickly explain the basics to you here. So there's two different occasions when you contact the oceanic controllers. The first one is when you're outside of their airspace, but your flight plan actually takes you into oceanic airspace and you have to request clearance and you have to request an arrival time to when you can enter into oceanic airspace. And this occasion is the second occasion when we're already inside oceanic airspace and the controller comes online and he's going to ask us for position reports. So rather than us requesting oceanic clearance, we're just going to contact the controller and give him our oceanic position report. Now just quickly before we contact the controller and give him the information that he needs for the position report, we're going to go ahead and enter in some new data in our computer. Now that we're going from waypoint 6 to waypoint 7, we can actually override waypoint 1 to waypoint 5. So we'll put in our new waypoint 1 now, 47030 West 5000. Good evening, Shamrock. One three Juliet with you level three three zero. Waypoint two is four six one zero zero west five three treble zero. North four four one four zero west six thousand. The new waypoint four is now going to be north four two four six zero west. Oh. I messed it up there. Alright, hold on, I'll get that. It's going to be north 42460 west 65000. And finally, the new waypoint 5 north 42000 west 67000. And we can't override waypoint 6 because we're using that right now. Position reports and oceanic control is one of those things in aviation that seems very intimidating and complex but it's actually quite straightforward and simple once you get your head around it. Basically the controller only wants to know three or four crucial bits of information so it's important that when we give our position report that we give the information that the controller is expecting to hear. So for an oceanic position report the first thing the controller is going to want to know is what time did we fly over the last waypoint we passed over. So if we're flying from waypoint 6 to waypoint 7, the controller wants to know what time did we fly over waypoint 6 at. The next thing he wants to know is what altitude we were at when we were at our last waypoint and what speed we were at. Then he wants to know, well, where are we going? He knows where we were and what time we were there. He wants to know now, well, where are we going next? So like we said in, in our example, we're going from waypoint 6 to waypoint 7. So where's waypoint 7? We're going to tell him where our waypoint 7 is and we're going to tell him what time we expect to be there. These are This is sensible bits of information here. So we've told him where we've just came from what time we flew over that waypoint at, what altitude we were at, what speed we were doing. We've also told them where we're going and what time we expect to be there. And then the last bit of information we give them is, hey, once we get to where we're going to this waypoint, this is our next waypoint after that. 
So again, in the example, we're going from waypoint 6 to waypoint 7. Well, he wants to know, well, hey, where's your waypoint 8? So we give him that information. We tell him which waypoint we're going to be tracking after the one that we're inbound right now. So when you think about it like that, it's actually not that complicated at all. We're telling him who we are, where we flew over, what time we flew over that point at, what altitude we were at when we flew over there, and how fast we were going. We've also included, well, that's where we were, here's where we're going now, what time we expect to get there, and also when we get there, when we're going after that. So it's very simple, that's all the information you need to include in your Oceanic Position Report. Now Concorde's position reports are slightly different. We'll include a block altitude which you'll hear me speak to the controller about. And this is different from subsonic aircraft that more or less stay at the same altitude for the whole Atlantic crossing. We actually climb or descend depending on what we need to do to keep the aircraft at Mach 2. So we get a block clearance rather than just a flight level clearance. Okay, we'll call the controller now with our position report. Shamwick Radio, Speedbird. Concorde 1, position report. Speedbird 1, Shamwick, hello, pass your message. Hello sir, Speedbird Concorde 1, reporting Concorde track Sierra November, correction, Sierra Mike, 20 West, at time 2110 Zulu, estimating Sierra Mike, 30 West, time 2130 Zulu, we're blocking between flight level 550 and flight level 600 to maintain Mach 2. Sierra Mike 40 West thereafter. Zero one, shall we copy Sierra Mike 20 West, time 2110 Zulu. Uh, mark the small 2, estimating Sierra Mike 30 West, 2130 Zulu, Sierra Mike 40 West after that. And copy block line 550 to 660. Okay, so we just read out our position report, the controller reads back what we've just said and we confirm that he said basically what we've said and that we're both talking from the same page and then we give our next position report once we get to our next waypoint. So all I did to achieve that was basically get the INS up and look at the distance and time function on the INS so that it would tell me how many minutes it was going to be until I arrived at my next waypoint. I told the controller what time we arrived over our last waypoint, what time we're going to be inbound to our next waypoint, and I told them where we were going after that. Now you also heard me talk about the block clearance altitude in there. That was because it was my first time talking with this controller, my first check-in with him. I confirmed that I was going to be blocking between flight level 550 and flight level 600 to maintain Mach 2. And what we'll do on the next position report is, when we fly over the waypoint, we'll actually write down what our specific altitude was at that point. Probably going to be flight level 600, but now that we have our block clearance, we'll actually start giving them specific flight levels. But we'll always be at Mach 2. Shamming Radio, Speedbird Concord 1 with a position report. Speedbird 1, Captain. Shamming Speedbird Concord 1 reporting Sierra Mike 30 West, time 2130 Zulu, flight level 591, Mach 2. Sierra, we're estimating correction, Sierra Mike 40 West, time 2150, Sierra Mike 50 West thereafter. Zero one, shall we copy? Zero Mike three zero West time two one three zero Zulu. Level five five zero block to six hundred mark decimal crash mark two. Estimating Zero Mike four zero West time two one five zero Zulu. Zero Mike five zero West after that. Speedbird one, correct. Sixty thousand feet. Maximum flight level. Now, because the engines are a little bit too overpowered right now in the X plane Concorde. We do see flight level 600 a lot more on the London to New York routes than Concorde would actually see it in real life. It actually wasn't very normal at all for Concorde on London to New York to see 60,000 feet, or indeed coming back the other way, New York to London. But as I mentioned, because it's open beta and the engines are a bit too overpowered, we do tend to get to 60,000 feet on most flights. So the procedure once we reach 60,000 feet is simply to engage the auto throttle and Mac hold with the max speed 2.01.
Shamag Radio. Speaker Concord 1 with a position of 4. Speaker 1, Fatima, Shamag Radio. Speaker 1 reporting Sierra Mike 40 West, time 2150 Zulu, flight level 600 Mach 2. Estimating Sierra Mike 50 West, time 2210 Zulu. Sierra, correction, 46 North, 53 West with domestic thereafter. Okay, so good morning, shall we copy Sierra Mike? 40 West time 2150 Zulu. Uh, block cruise 550 to 600 block 2, Sierra Mike 50 West estimated at 2210 and 46 North 50, correction, 46 North 53 West. Speedboat 1, correct. Speedboat 1, uh, sorry, this is your Oh, Speedboat 1 after Sierra Mike 50 West, which did a mess. Speedboat 1, 50 West, welcome. All right, we've cut forward a little bit here. The oceanic controller that we had is offline now. We're going to get some navigation data into the aircraft. If you remember earlier on in the flight, we inputted new waypoints up to waypoint 5. Well, now we're going to input new waypoints up to waypoint 8. So we'll select our new waypoint 6, enter into keyboard entry mode, and then we'll use our numpad to enter in our new waypoint for 6. 39212 and west 70300. We'll now do a new waypoint 7. North 39246, West 71426. And finally for now at New Waypoint 8, North 39494, West 72498. We can't override Waypoint 9 because we're using that right now. But we can get our DME update set up for St John's Island. So we have 1135 set, we're going to take it on Waypoint 3. We'll go into DME entry mode again on the INS by pressing left alt 7 and 9 and we'll enter in the coordinates for St John's Island North 47291 West 52511 and we'll insert the rounded up altitude which is 1000 feet and we can see that we're currently still 330 odd miles away we won't be able to pick up the signal for that navigation beacon until we're inside around about 220 miles. Now that we're within 200 miles of the navigation beacon, we're picking up a signal, which you can see in the bottom left hand side of the screen. That also matches up with what the INS computer is telling us what the distance is to that navigation beacon. So we're confident that we're taking a DME update from the same position. And to start the DME update, because we've already entered the data into the INS computer, we just need to press waypoint change 3, because we're already in DME entry mode. OK, we're approaching just about 100 miles before our deceleration point. We'll turn the seatbelt signs on now. We're going to go for our deceleration approximately 6 zero miles before our waypoint 6, which is Kenda. Before we start the deceleration, we're going to go ahead and put the rest of the navigation information into the aircraft. So we have a new waypoint 9 now, north 40010, west 73517. And we'll put in our new waypoint 1. New waypoint 2. And again, guys, I'll put all these navigation coordinates in the video description for you. Alright, the last one we put in, uh, waypoint 4, we're putting for Kennedy. Okay, we are good for LNAV now. We're going to go ahead and take a DME update from Nantucket on 116.2. We see that we're 84 miles away. So we're now 
DME update in from Nantucket Island. We'll get our descent primed up here and select flight level 320. We also have the vertical speed initial primed up as well. It's going to be a very simple process to start the deceleration. All we're going to do is take manual control of the throttles, slowly bring the power back to approximately 94% N2 and then select altitude acquire. Our fuel is bang on target for this stage of the flight, just under 24 tonnes. Okay, we're going to get our charts up ready for going into New York. The first chart we'll get up is our airport chart, so that once we land, if we get some taxi instructions that we're not familiar with, we can quickly reference that. And we want to have the chart up for the approach that we're shooting for on the way in. Now we're hoping to get the VOR for runway 13 left, so we'll get that approach chart up. I've flown this approach many times, I'm very familiar with it, but it's always just a good idea whenever we're going into anywhere, regardless of how familiar you are with it, get the charts up. So this approach is one of the perks of the job of being a Concorde pilot. It's very challenging, but very rewarding. We come over Canarsie at about roughly 2,000 feet, and we uh, hug the coastline almost over the highway that runs towards the airport, and do a big swooping right-hand turn down onto the runway. It's fantastic. If we do this approach right, we should roll out onto the centre line of the runway at 200 feet. Before we start descending, we're also going to take a look at the runway information and get our chart up for the ILS and get that information set up into the aircraft. It's one less job to do once we're down low at altitude. So the runway heading is 134 degrees, we'll get that set on 1 and 2, and the ILS is 111.5. Now we're not going to set that on nav 1 just yet, but we will write that down so that we can quickly reference it and we don't need to bring up the charts, but obviously it is available in the charts should we need it. Okay, 5 miles until the deceleration point now, we're going to take manual control with the throttles. And when we get to 60 miles, we're going to bring the throttle back to 18% TLA. You'll see a little notch on the throttle lever if you look. Just a little, a little arrow, a tiny little white arrow on the side of the throttle there, the left hand side. We're looking to bring the throttle back to that position. Which normally gives us about 94, 93% on N2. You see on the top gauge there. As soon as the airspeed starts moving, we select altitude acquire because we have the vertical speed already primed, the nose automatically starts pitching down. And then we manually take over the vertical speed adjustments to target 350 knots on the way down. So at this stage we don't take any more power off, we simply just manipulate the vertical speed to maintain 350 knots. So this is very similar to what we were doing on the way up on our supersonic climb. Now we're doing the same thing on the way down. So on the way up we were trying to keep the speed at our maximum limit. Now we're trying to target the speed at 350 knots on the way down. We'll set the frequency for Kennedy on Radio 2 and we can see from DME2 that we're currently 182 miles away. So no need to panic and start decelerating and descending too quickly. We're still over 180 miles away from New York.
Just getting my ATC frequencies prepared here for arriving into New York. This is one of the points where we need to be very careful with what the aircraft's doing here and manage our vertical speed. Very often when the aircraft's turning left or right as well as climbing or descending, the vertical speed starts to wander and you're seeing the aircraft do that now. So I'm just going to keep very sharp on the vertical speed and I'll maybe ask the aircraft to kind of go for some limits that it won't actually get to but just to make sure that the nose is pushing in the right direction. Again, the target here is to stay at 350 knots. We haven't taken any more power off from when we initially took the power off at the top of descent, and we're still just riding that rate of descent on 350 knots. Now that we've descended below 50,000 feet as part of our deceleration, we come up to the overhead panel and change our engine flight rating from the cruise rating that it's in back to climb. We also turn on our pressure static heaters and our ADS engine probe heaters as we're coming back down into the cold regime of flying Concorde again. We check that the seatbelt signs are on and all appropriate switches are in their corresponding position. We can hop into the back to make sure that the engineer is looking after the fuel profile. We can turn the D air pump off in the front as there's no fuel up top and we can also turn off the inlet valves. We're going to prime the autopilot down to 20,000 feet at this stage. We are now inbound to the waypoint Lind. And we're aiming to be at Cameron at about 20,000 feet. I can see from the ATC client that there is ATC online on VATSIM for New York. So we're probably going to be getting a ping from someone very shortly. We still haven't touched the throttle since we started our initial descent. And again, because the aircraft's turning as well as descending, we're just going to manage that vertical speed to make sure she stays on profile for 350 knots. Now at this stage you might be tempted to open the Flight Engineer menu and select Trim Fuel to Flight. I initially did that when I first started flying the aircraft as well. However, because the aircraft's in open beta, when the engineer changes the fuel setting, it happens instantaneously and as a result the aircraft can become a little bit unstable for a couple of seconds. So I've found that the best way is actually to leave the fuel trim in the flight position until we get down to about 10,000 feet and then we'll ask the engineer to simply trim the fuel for landing. Okay, New York Center is online on 125325, so we're going to tune his frequency now. And I see that New York Approach is also online on 128125. So we're going to have a good service coming all the way in. And there's a message from New York Centre asking me to contact him. Perfect timing. Chile 29 on your Centre, Roger. New York Centre, good evening, sir. Speedbird Concord 1 with you, passing flight level 3900 for flight level 200 by Owens.
the bird. Concord 1, New York Death Center, Roger. Cross. Owens, enemy, maintain 1 4000. Kennedy, Altimer 2966. Okay, cross Owens and maintain 1 4 14,000. 2966, speedbird 1. Okay, so he's asking us to be 6,000 feet lower than we were intending. So it's a good job we're flying Concord, ladies and gentlemen. Most aircraft probably wouldn't be able to make that restriction, but I'm pretty confident we're going to be able to make this. We have some clever tricks up our sleeve to help us descend very quickly indeed. So we're going to set our primes up here. 1, 4, 14,000. And he's giving us the altimeter as well. We'll get that set up. 2, 9, or 6, 6. Cross check that, 29 or 66. Now you can see if we keep decelerating at this rate, we're going to overspeed. But once we get subsonic below Mach 0.95, we can actually open up our reversers on engines 2 and 3. Now we can't put any thrust through them, but we can deploy the reverse air buckets into the airstream while the engine is in idle and that creates a significant amount of drag and helps us to stop the aircraft from overspeeding while we descend at high rates. Caution. Fuel status. 20 tonnes. Oh, we didn't hear the voice call there. I'll bring the reverser back in and I'll put it back out so you can hear the voice call. Reverser deployed. And look how fast our airspeed is dropping now. And this is something the Concorde would do very often in real life, especially if ATC spot a window where they can fit Concorde in. And you can see from our centre of gravity position in the middle of the screen that the flight engineer is doing a good job of trimming the fuel so that our center of gravity moves forward. Tiner, good evening, American 809, title of 8200 for 11,055 heading. American 809, your proceed direct to merit, the proceed direct to merit, climb maintain 17,000. Direct merit, now up to 17,000, American 809. Speedbird, Conquer 1, descend and maintain 9,000. Send him in 10, 9 or 1,000, speedbird 1. We're now below 19 tonnes of fuel, which in this configuration is our maximum landing weight, so we know that we are now safe to land below our maximum landing weight. Okay, we now have the clearance to go down below 10,000. And once we go through 10, that will trigger some checklist items for us. We also have to obey the regular restriction, like everybody else, 250 knots below 10,000 feet on the way down. Kennedy tuned on one now, 115.9. A little bit of turbulence on the way down. Alright, we're now going through 10,000 feet, so we'll come to our overhead panel and change our engine rating from flight to takeoff. We'll jump into the back seat and turn our brake fans on. We'll change the engine control schedule from normal to approach. And now we'll ask the engineer to trim the fuel for landing. Check that the fuel pumps are off that need to be off. Five, six, seven, and eight, they can all go off. The pumps up top are off. Tank 11 is off. 
Okay, we can take the visor and the nose down now, below 10,000 feet. The aircraft has captured 9,000 feet. And while we have a little minute to relax here, we're going to go ahead and get a cheeky DME update from New York. So we'll put in the latitude and longitude of the VOR at New York, which is tuned on NAV1-1159. We'll set the altitude as 0,000 feet. And we'll select waypoint change 6. And we'll get a DME update from New York. Speedbird Concord 1, contact approach 128.12. 12812, cheers, Speedbird 1. 1826, clear, uh, by heading 040, 070, 18, 5000. 5000, it's 1826. Confirm 040, on the heading, please. New York approach, good evening. Speedbird Concord 1 with you, flight level, correction 9000 inbound. Owens, correction, Cameron, not doing so well. Speaker Concord 1 Heavy, New York approach. Uh, are you? Yeah, you can't take an R now, can you? Yeah, no, sir, we can't accept the VOR approach for runway 1 for your left, however, Speaker 1. I can issue it to you, unless uh, it's real world, because VOR, the Canarsie VOR is out of service. If you want, I can still give it to you. Roger, we are happy with that, sir. Or we can take the parkway visual. We can sort of get it in that way for one free left, speedbird one. You know what? I like it. Expect the parkway vision, everyone. Uh, you can take one three left, or can you take one three right? Ah, we prefer one free left if possible, sir, speedbird one. Speedbird one, expect the parkway vision, runway one three left, at Kennedy, altimeter two nine or six six. Expecting the parkway visual for one three left. Thanks, two nine or six six, speedbird one. Alright, perfect. We managed to negotiate four, onto the the more difficult runway one free left, which is the one we wanted. It's the best looking approach anyway as well. Now he's telling us that the VOR at Canarsie is unserviceable, so they're not using that. They're only using the RNAV, so however there's another approach which is basically the exact same as the VOR approach except it's called the Parkway Visual. And even though I'm not flying on the real world time right now, it is still daylight in New York in real life. So this guy's happy to clear me on the Parkway visual approach for one free lift. Good man. I love the VATSIM controllers in New York. They're right up there with the London controllers. They're a close second place to the London controllers on VATSIM. I love those guys. Speedbird Concord 1, flying 360. Speedbird 1, 360. I can actually show you the Parkway Vigil on my charts here. So here's the Parkway Vigil. So like you can see, pretty much identical to the VOR approach, it's just that it's all visual. We fly overhead Canarsie, and we can do that visually, and we leave there about we leave Canarsie heading 041 degrees and we hug the highway that's going to be on our left hand side 
same as the other. Is it correct? If I'm and as we cross the river, and the highway gets really close on our left hand side, we start turning the aircraft to the right. A nice gentle bank initially. And then approaching our runway and getting lower to the ground, we sharpen the turn up a little bit. And the plan is to roll out on the runway centre line at 200 feet. But it's easier said than done. It's quite a difficult approach. Super Concord 1, fly heading 340, send a maintain 5000. 340, descend and maintain 5000. Speed right back. Okay, down to 5000. We'll slow down to 240 knots. And we'll bring the nose all the way down now. We'll tune the ILS for runway 1 free left. Double check the altimeter set. This is always the point where I start to get a little bit nervous. Even though I've been flying flight sims for more than 20 years. I still get a little bit nervous. So our current aircraft weight is just over 106 tonnes, so we're going to plan an arrival weight for 105 tonnes. Super 1, continue to send us and maintain 3,000. And 3,000, Super 1. Emirates 93, 92, reaching 11,000 feet. Emirates 93, 92, roger. Fly heading 050, I'm going to have a further, or center's going to have a further. Heading 050, Emirates 93, 92. That's going to give us a V-Ref speed of about 158 knots, 158. So we're going to pop about 3 knots on top of that for safety, 161. Emirates 9392, contact New York Center 12532, have a safe flight. 12532, Emirates 9392, bye bye. Our initial approach speed will be around about 190 knots, 190. And then as we get closer to the runway, within about 4 miles, we'll start to bring our speed down to around about 175, 180 knots. And as we get closer to the runway, we'll slowly start to allow the power to come back to our final V-Ref speed of 158 knots. However, we want to put some extra overhead on that because we do have to do a right-hand turn all the way on to final. And we want to leave a little overhead just for safety. We're getting very close now, we're 17 miles away from Kennedy, just establishing at 3,000 feet. It's at this point I like to reset the vertical speed to something more appropriate for this altitude around about a thousand feet per minute Fever 1, uh, turn up heading 320 Left 320, Fever 1 Time to just have a quick breath and make sure we've done everything Landing lights are not required The engine control schedule is set to approach The brake fans are on 
and the engine rating mode is set to take off. And at Fever 1, Rockaway Point is off your 1 to 2 o'clock in 8 miles. Report Rockaway Point in sight. Roger, sir. We're actually in the clouds at the moment. We can't see the ground to our right hand side. Requesting uh, down to 1500 for our visual on Rockaway, Speaker 1. Uh, Speaker Concord 1, descend and maintain 2000. I could, let me see if I can get you out there. Fine, 2000 for now, Speaker 1. Never be afraid to tell the controller what you can see. Remember, he's on the ground looking at a scope. You're on a screen for him. He's not up here like flying around looking out the window, so he can't see what you can see. So. If you can't see the, the, the airport or whatever it is he's asking you to look for, just pipe up and tell him. Speedbird 1, visual on Rockaway Point. Speedbird 1, cross Rockaway Point at or above 2000, you're clear for the Parkway visual, only 13 left. Cross Rockaway at or above 2000, cleared for the Parkway visual, 13 left, Speedbird 1. Alright, now I'm super nervous. So you can see New York City right in front of us, that looks awesome. We have our clearance, so we're not cleared to land just yet, but we are cleared for the approach. Now I haven't done this thousands of times, but I've done it. I've done it a fair number of times, I'm quite familiar with it, but it never gets easy. It's like, it's actually very similar to the Case 1 on an aircraft carrier a little bit. Same sort of pressure, same sort of tension. You have to be quite specific with the flying. I really enjoy the challenge. So you can see on the right hand side here, we can see Canarsie. You can see that abandoned airfield just on the right on that little sort of island looking bit. We can see Canarsie there. We want to be flying over that and leaving that area as we go overhead heading 040. And there's a large highway on the left that hugs the coastline. We want to be as close to that as we can. Contact Kennedy Tower, 119.1, you have a safe flight. 119.1, thanks for your help, sir. Speaker 1. See you. See you. Recon controller, we see the route you filed. Is there any specific path that you're trying to follow or intentions you have? So there's Canarsie right in front of us on our right hand side now. Uh, negative, sir. We uh, got you that route. Um, uh, you didn't get it? I'm going to set our minimum safe altitude at 600 um, feet on the autopilot uh, they're right now. I'm just wondering if there's any specific path that the route is following. Negative. Tower, hello. Speedbird Concord 1, the parkway visual for 13, you left. Speedbird Concord 1, Kennedy Tower, good evening. Continue approach for parkway visual 13 left. Gear coming Continue down. Approach, Speedbird 1. Start a gentle autopilot descent right now. We'll bring the gear down. Check that the old pilot's got us in a nice little descent here. Gear down. Four greens. So if you're learning to do this approach, I did that over Canarsie. So leaving Canarsie, heading 040, descending from 2,000 feet. You can see the highway in front of us on the left. That's the highway that we want to get as close to as possible. Uh, left side tap calling, what's your call sign? Without actually crossing over it. Tap forward. 1038, request request, standby. Slow the aircraft down to 190 knots, the gear is down. Standby 1038. Speedbird, Concord 1 Heavy, uh, wind 110 at 10, runway 13 left, left. Speedbird, Concord 1 Roger, clear to land, runway 13 left. Alright, I'm going to jump in here. My throttles, my aircraft. We have the landing clearance. Oh, she's going left. I got it, I got it. Alright, so we want to descend nice and easy here. Not in a hurry to get too low. It's a bit windy, we're getting bumped around quite a lot as well. Northwest, 1999, wind 110 at 10, runway 13 right. So again, uh, just, hugging the, so again, just hugging this highway on our left, we can still see it, we're pretty close. I'm going to start the slow right turn for the runway now. We want to keep descending, we're not looking for any 
aids from the ILS or anything. We can't even see the ILS right now. We're not even tuned on to it. It should come up just before we get there. Northwest 1999, wind 110 at 10, fly heading 110, Romeo 13 right, clear for takeoff. We are a little bit high at the moment. We're starting to work that down. Okay, believe it or not, I can actually see the runway right now. JetBlue 1121, uh, I have the clearance in a second. And I have messed this up slightly here, guys. I've been a little bit too tight on the turn. I can salvage okay, this. Uh, JetBlue 1121, uh, you're clear I can to rescue Kennedy it, but Airport. I'm a little bit too tight at the moment. We'll try and work that down. Uh, actually, stand by, JetBlue 1121. I'm just tightening this up here. Out. 300. JetBlue 1121, stand by. I'm a tiny bit late on this turn, but we're working it out. We're working it 200. out. 200. 200 feet rolling out the center line. 100 feet. Keep going down, keep Retarded. flying it down, keep flying it down. 50 feet. Start bringing the power back. 40. 20. Little flare. 10. Get in, go. Contact. Keep her counter one, welcome to Kennedy, Agent Right when able. Reverse deployed. Reverse. Speedbird one, D right when able. Full power. Step 1121, I have your clearance for real now. Advise ready to copy. All right, Always looks like we're going to overshoot. Step 1121, Try not to use the wheel Kennedy brakes Vier until Rainer we're below 100 knots. Uh, so reverse only, Kennedy above 100 knots. So it always looks like we're never going to slow down in time, but then we bring the brakes in below 100 knots and really start slowing the aircraft down. We'll take the nose to five. That wasn't a great landing, unfortunately I messed up the approach there a little bit too tight and then subsequently that messed up our entry onto the centre line, but I will get away with that, it wasn't, wasn't too bad, but I would have liked to have done a little bit better. But welcome to New York guys, welcome to New York, a safe arrival. We've arrived with more than 10 tonnes of fuel. Roger, uh, pushing at our discretion for 1121, uh, one through right for the expected runway for departure and uh, information off on board. Northwest 1999, contact departure 128.12, have a nice night. Can see New York City in the front there. I've got the awesome add on New York airport scenery and the New York City scenery. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think it's Drew SK or something like that. UX plane veterans will know what I'm talking about. Super Concord 1, Terminal 1, taxi via Yankee Alpha, Bravo, right onto Mike Alpha, cross runway 22 right. If possible, sir, we'd like the uh, British Airways Terminal 7, please. Speedbird 1. Terminal 7, my mistake, I was going with Air France there. Uh, Terminal 7, taxi via Yankee Alpha, Bravo, then a left onto Whiskey, cross runway 22 right. Okay, Terminal 7, Yankee Alpha, left onto Bravo, uh, cross 22 right for Speedbird 1. Alright, so we've got a taxi chart up, I'll show you guys where we're going. We're heading back to the British Airways terminal. God damn it, didn't mean to do that. So we're going up to the British Airways terminal, terminal 7. I disconnected uh, for a second, uh, can you hear me? JetBlue 1121, read you 4x5, Kendall Tower. Roger, 4x5, uh, we're acknowledging this... Uh, we can go ahead and shut down engines two and three now. We don't need four engines to taxi when the aircraft's as light as this. Eleven tons of fuel now, above our ten ton target that we were talking about earlier on in flight. So that worked out quite nicely. I mean, this guy shouldn't be here. This is a British Airways terminal, man. Come on. Uh, Delta six twenty five, what's your holding up the British Airways flagship, sir? Come on. What is this? 
How dare you? Delta 625, okay, contact departure 1012. Engines 2 and engines 3. Departure 625. We can also turn off our pressure static heaters and ADS engine probe heaters. We don't need those anymore. Alright, we'll release the brake. Yeah, that's right. I got your number, buddy. <laughs> I got your number, pal. Now that we're inside Terminal 7, we'll turn off our mode Charlie. And there is another non-BA aircraft. What is going on in New York these days, guys? You think this was Terminal 5 at Heathrow? Charlie Alpha Foxtrot. Who's this guy? Tower Clipper in E95. Clipper uh, E95, go ahead. Yeah, was that supposed to be a right or left hand turn oh, on the Bravo? We're going out for, of Bravo. Um, Take a uh, right off the Bravo, then off the Papa, then Papa Fox Trap for Clipper 95 heavy. No harm, no foul. Clipper 95, uh, did you get that transmission? Take a right onto Bravo. All right, yeah, we did. We uh, did take a right onto Bravo from Victor Alpha. Thanks. And we are on stand. Kemper 1038, runway 13 right, taxi via right onto Bravo, Papa, hold short. Make sure the parking brake right is Papa applied. Africa. Turn the transponder off. We can close down engine number one now. Turn off the auto throttle for engine one. Train master here can come off. And we'll turn off the fasten seat belt sign. Delta 1104, fly heading 185, wind 110 at 10, zero, rolling 13 right, clear for takeoff. Heading 185, 13 right, clear for takeoff, up 1104. We'll turn the brake fans off. Turn off the engine pumps for engines 1, 2, and 3. We'll cycle forward to our shutdown checklists. Before we shut down our final engine and turn off our hydraulics, we'll bring the nose and the visor up. We can turn the radio okay, off now. We're going to be getting number 4859. Uh, sorry, RNAV 13 left. We'll turn off our hydraulics. We'll ask the ground crew to connect the ground power unit. We'll deploy the stairs to the side of the aircraft and open the door. And turn on the air conditioning ground unit.
We'll set the emergency generator to auto and open the SSB switch. And we're now ready to shut down engine number four. We'll turn off the auto throttle and turn off the anti-collision and nav light. And shut down the engine number four feed pumps. Turn all three INS systems off. Check that all the fuel pumps are off. Check the engine control schedule back to normal. Engine idle back to auto. The engine number four take off N1 limiter back to normal. Turn off all the master CBs. Flight control inverters can come off. Flight control augmentators selected to mechanical. And the anti-stall system can come off. Air data computers off. And that's it guys, everything's shut down. Welcome to New York. Thank you so much for watching guys. I know this one has been a lot to take in, but I hope you guys can take away a lot of lessons that will help you get your supersonic wings and you can start enjoying the aircraft as much as I do. She isn't finished just yet and she has some way to go, but I honestly think that even in her current state, the magic is still there and you can get the Concorde experience from days gone by in the amazing looking X-Plane 11. At the moment I'm flying the aircraft a lot live on Twitch, so make sure you click on the Twitch link in the video description and maybe come along and check me out flying the Concorde live on VATSIM sometime. If you have any questions leave them for me in the chat and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I'll put all the links to the navigation information and relevant links to the aircraft in the video description for you guys. Just a quick disclaimer in at the end to say that I am not a real pilot, I have no real world certifications or ratings, and also a polite reminder that the aircraft is still in open beta, so please don't judge it too harshly. I personally think it's fantastic and worth every single penny, and if you're a Concorde fan, I highly encourage you to go out and buy the aircraft for X-Plane and help support the development team and enjoy the aircraft updates as they come down the line. Alright, thanks again for watching guys. Follow me on Twitch. I'll see you busters next time. Top Gun and Volleyball. Maverick out.